Hi, I'm Lance Lambert. Thanks for tuning in to the Vintage Vehicle Show. We are here at the Quinault Beach Resort and Casino at Ocean Shores, Washington. This is a great place to come have fun, and that's what we're going to do today. There is a car show here today, the High Rolling Hot Rods Car Show. There are about 250 cars here, a lot of great people. And speaking of great people, I am surrounded by a bevy of beauties here. Uh, Emily, tell us a little bit about uh, what this cheerleader thing is. We are the Grays Harbor Bearcat Cheerleading Squad, and we are a semi-pro football team here on Grays Harbor. We are actually nonprofit, so all the money that we make throughout the season, we give back to youth sports around the community. Okay. Well, I certainly can identify because years have proven that the Vintage Vehicle Show is also nonprofit. So we uh, really appreciate you guys being out today. We appreciate you watching. So do what I tell you to do every week. Just kick back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right. <laughs> I'm with Paul Henderson, who came all the way from Washougal, Washington, to appear at this show. Paul, this is an absolutely beautiful 1955 Thunderbird. Tell us about it. Thanks, Lance. Uh, it's a 1955. It was built in July of 1955, late in the model year, and uh, it's this uh, goldenrod yellow. This is a stock color. There were very few of these in 1955, uh, but it was a big color in 1956. Um, and we have some history on the car. The first owner was the uh, mayor of Hermosa Beach, California, and um, it was restored, uh, frame-up restoration in 1992, and then a mechanical restoration in 1997. So, uh, and then I got it, did a few more things to it to kind of bring it up to speed, so it's a fun car. It seems to me that 55, 56, and 57 Thunderbirds, the little birds, across the board, everybody loves them. The Rat Rodders love them. The, the Concord crowd love them. What kind of reaction are you getting from people? Pretty much the same thing. Everybody comes by, and they all have a, this great feeling. Like, oh, isn't that a neat car? Oh, look at that. That's a nice car. And, uh, yeah, it just it strikes a chord with people. When you're driving it, does it feel like a sports car? Does it feel like a luxury car? What, what's the, the aura of the car? Uh, no, it doesn't feel like a sports car. <laughs> Not like a modern sports car, anyway. Uh, it's pretty powerful. It's got a, it's a 292 V8 in the thing, and it, it, it's got plenty of oomph to it. Um, 
It's a, uh, it, but yeah, it's 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 a bigger car feel actually than the size of the car would would indicate. Mm-hmm. I know you've been in the hobby for a long time. You're wearing a jacket from the Steeds Car Club. What's that all about? Oh, the Steeds Car Club. Like you don't know. Yeah, yeah I was uh, I was actually a member of the Steeds back in the '60s, a club founded by you, yeah. and. Uh, uh, yeah. So just, oh gosh, I recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, we came back a couple of years ago, and here we are. All right. Yeah, they're crawling all over the place. Well, Paul, thank you very much for uh, being uh, on the show. And if if I didn't know you, I would say uh, thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, but being I do know you, just. Come on. <laughs> Anybody that's watched the show for any length of time knows that I really like orphan cars and I really like Packards. Jim Millette, your 40 Packard is absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Thank Tell you. us a little bit about it. Oh, it's a 1940 Packard. Um, you know, we first originally had it, it was a stock and we used to do oh, hospital shows and stuff like that with it. And then about eight or nine years ago, my wife decided to make it a street rot. <laughs> so. We wanted to keep it as close to stock as possible to make it look stock, and uh, but it's got all the modern conveniences of a brand new car. It's uh, got air conditioning, it's got uh, the V8 and everything like that, so it rides just like a brand new vehicle, power steering. At, at Packard shows or car shows, do any of the, the Packard crowd give you a rough time for changing the running gear? Yes, they do. Yeah, We're not well liked. <laughs> but... Uh, this car, when it was made, brand new, this was uh, Packard's cheap car. It was $795 brand new. And so uh, a lot of the Packard people didn't like it to start with. They thought it degraded degraded the Packards. And uh, so this Packard's never been liked from the beginning. <laughs> well, I know Packard was trying to make some of their cars more affordable and, and survive. And, and do you think that was the beginning of the end for Packard when they made that decision? Or they would have died sooner if hadn't they made it? They would have died sooner. So a lot of these ended up being taxi cabs, and uh, they're real reliable as taxi cabs with the little six-cylinder in them. But uh, when it was stock and it went to the big Packard meets, this was kind of low-end. So now we're really low-end when we go to 
<laughs> you mentioned some details on the running gear, but tell us a little bit more about that. A company called Fat Man out of South Carolina made the whole undercarriage on the front. Um, then we stuck a Chevrolet engine in it, new one, and has an overdrive automatic transmission and a Ford rear end. So everything's been changed a little bit underneath there. But the rest of it we've tried to keep stock and make it look just like it came off the showroom floor. And this cruises down the highway, I would think, just no problem. No problem. And we've got a couple tickets to prove that. <laughs> well, I had no problem deciding I wanted to interview you about this car. So, Jim, thank you very much for talking to us about your 40 Packard. Thank you. Pat Sonnen, this is a very nice 35 Rio and maybe the first 35 Rio I have ever seen at a car show or maybe anywhere. Yeah, it's pretty rare. It's one of uh, 500 made. It's a 7 uh, Rio Royale 7S, and the way it reads out, it's one of 500. I know very little about that company. Tell us a little bit of the history. Uh, well, the Rio Motor Company was started back in the, uh, the 20s, I believe. They went out of business in 1936, and what broke them was... Uh, research and development on an automatic transmission which I have with, with the car it's not in it but I have it and, uh, and then of course they built trucks after that and this car actually if we could look under it has got a truck frame under it. Is that REO Speedwagon Rio? Yep 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 yeah so it's uh, it's pretty pretty heavy duty car. There's a Packard here that I was talking to the owner of, and he's, uh, you know, resto rotted or street rotted it up a bit, and he said he gets a bit of grief from the Packard crowd. How's the real crowd treating you? Ah, uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, when I got the car, I got it from uh, the mayor of Sumner. Actually, he brought it from Illinois, and he kind of gave up on it. And of course, uh, uh, there was a few things missing, and I went. The hood arm was one of them. I went to the Rio Club, and uh, I didn't get a very good reception when they found out what I was going to do with the car. But uh, it's a driver now. But What's the running gear on it? Uh, it's got a 396 mild bill Chevy. It's got Morrison banana clip front end, four bar suspension, 350 transmission, and uh, uh, three seven O's in the rear end. Pat, I'm going to do you a favor here. I have a question for you, but you have a plaque on the front, and ladies and gentlemen, it's the King's Men, not the King's Men. I know that club has been called the King's Men for a long time. One of the, the oldest clubs in the Pacific Northwest, one of the most respected clubs in the Northwest. I've been in a club for, for five years, and I'm also a sponsor of the club because I believe in what they do. Um, all our money goes to charity, um, broken families, uh, food banks, and uh, I just like the way they operate. So I'm one of the also one of the sponsors, and uh, a good bunch of guys. Um, we've just brought in some new members. We try to keep it around 41, 42 members, no, no, no more. And uh, great bunch of guys, and and the wives are, everybody gets along. It's just a good club. We have a lot of fun together. The advantage of being in a car club as opposed to not being in a club, what do you think? Uh, there's always somebody in the club that has a different trade. And when you run into problems, you can usually go to one or the other guys and get a little advice, and it, it helps out. Yeah. Well, the club I'm in, my, my strength in that club is writing checks. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess my, my strength is I'm just... Uh, a sponsor and I'm a, a good member. So. Well, Pat, thank you very much for being on the Vintage Vehicle Show. This is a beautiful car. Thank you. You are looking at a celebrity, and it is not Don Richardson standing next to me. It is this beautiful car that is very, very famous. How did you come to tell us a little bit about it and uh, the history of it? And this, this is a significant car worldwide, not just locally. Well, I actually acquired the car back in 1983. I had a friend of mine had it in his basement, and it was in pieces, total basket case. I uh, ended up purchasing the car and uh, worked on it for about two and a half years, finished it. But uh, the actual history of the car is it was built in the early 50s. Uh, started in 1952, finished in 54, timed on the salt flats, drag raced. Uh, just a full custom car that was kind of unused to be such a race car and did, did so well on the salt flats and, and drag racing. 
and it did really well in drag racing for the time. Yeah, actually, it, uh, in, uh, in 1954, it went 104 miles an hour and a quarter mile, which was which was a huge thing back then. Yeah, back then, doing 85 was a big deal. It was, it was, and it didn't do so well on the salt. It went 126 on 147 record, but he was there. He drove it there and raced it and, and drove it home. And magazine coverage, this has, I, I just recently was reading a copy of Rodder's Journal. This was in it. Uh, it it's been in, you have a Rod and Custom sticker in the window. Yes, it was actually on the cover of Rod and Custom in 1953, the first year for the magazine. Uh, featured in Primer and then featured the next year in Hot Rod magazine uh, when it was painted. But uh, it's had a lot of coverage over the years just because of the the wonderful styling that the owner at the time, Doug Rice, did to it. He was a young kid, but he had a great idea with his car, and it turned out to be a... people liked it. What's the running gear on it? The running gear now is actually a small block Chevy, and, and auto, it has a turbo 350 Chevy rear end. It's really r newer running gear, but at the time I got the car, none of the race gear was actually available. Um, and it was it I got the car in pieces and I just wanted to drive the car and I have ever since when you have the lineage that something like this has and the history it creates great value and great interest do, do you think that's going to continue with other cars that are being discovered oh I think it's going to just keep happening over and over I've actually owned this car since 1983 almost 30 years I've driven it quite a bit of the time but just in the last couple years the interest in the car because it's been saved and and out there it's just just enormous it's it's almost like the car was built again uh, just recently and so it's been neat that people have seen it appreciated it been in lots of magazines but all these kinds of cars are just really popular right now and people watching right now are looking at the number on the door and wondering uh, the number of the letter what what's that about well that number was the number in 1954 for the Bonneville salt flats it was there for three years and each year they had it had a different number but that's the 1954 race number uh -huh. well Don it's a beautiful car a uh, real honor to be able to have it on the vintage vehicle show so thank you very much for uh, doing such a good job of yeah. keeping the history alive thank you very much that's great
This gentleman standing next to me is one of those people that I've been going to car shows for years and years and years, and Bob Aarons, I just run into you just about every show. We must have the same taste or something. Yeah. And then speaking of the same taste, this 57 Merc is very cool, a car you don't see very often, uh, really rare. It's, it's sort of got the George Jetson thing going, and I didn't know you owned this car. Tell us about it. Well, I bought it uh, probably in 94. I went by a, a car lot in Tacoma, and it was sitting in the car lot, one of those car lots that sells cars for under 500 bucks and uh i turned around went back and bought it from the guy and drove it home sat at my garage for well till last year and then i painted it and it's got the original interior the original engine and everything in it and they're very different for the time. They're yeah. very space agey, and and like I said, George Jetson, and and you know the antenna sticking out of the top, and very unique. Uh, how did that work out for the the Ford company? Did they sell a lot of these? No, no, because they were real expensive, and uh, like these antennas here, they're vents, and inside you control the air, and the back window rolls up and down, so the air goes through it. The steering wheel is cut the top so it's not round, mm -hmm. so it's better visibility. Uh, this car had all kinds of different stuff on it that cars normally don't have. Did it take a while to uh, get used to driving something with the, the you know, the, that, that steering wheel seems odd to me. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and it's got push button transmission shifters and... You know, I've been avoiding the word Edsel here for quite a while. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much like an Edsel, it's different. Uh, different like an Etzel. Mm -hmm. I would think there are a lot of people, maybe younger, that just don't know what this is. Do you run into that? Oh, yeah. Pe people always wonder, especially with these antennas up here. Mm -hmm. uh, and the back seat is huge in this car. Uh, it's got a lot of power. It's got a big engine for the year. And what is that? Uh, 368. Uh, I forget how many horsepower it is, but it's uh, it's plenty fast enough, powerful enough. So. The other end of the, uh, the top here, I mean, you have these really cool uh, antennae vent things, but the back window is pretty unique. Yeah, it's a power up and down. The rear window. Yeah, and it, Mercury is kind of known for that. They had a lot of models with that, I think all the way up into the early 60s, where the back window went up and down. Uh, well, Tim likes it, uh, our, our camera and producer, he likes it when I tell warm and fuzzy stories. And, and when this car, when these were new, I had some relatives, the Lamberts in uh, Bremerton, Washington, and uh, Ricky Darrell and Dennis Lambert and I would go out and sit in this, uh, their Mercury in the garage and make that back window go up and down. Yeah, yeah. I had an aunt and uncle in California that had this particular car, but it was a two-door, uh, and it was blue and white instead of... But I always thought it was neat that the back window went up and down when I was a kid. Yeah. Well, it is neat, uh, and it's neat that you brought it to the show. So, Bob Aarons, okay. thank you very much for coming out to the show today. Yeah. Thank you. All right.
What a great time we've had here at the High Rolling Hot Rods at the Quinault Beach Resort and Casino. A big thank you to the crew there. They have taken really good care of us. A big thank you to everybody that took the time to talk to us about their cars. And a big thank you to you for watching the show. We wouldn't have a show if it wasn't for you. So thank you very much, and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.